Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu. You're listening to the What's Up in Muslim show brought to you by the Islamic Vibes podcast, and I am your host, Majid. On today's show, I'm joined by my co hosts, Rash, Kam, and Mudi. Assalamu alaikum, brothers. How are you doing? How is everything? Good. Mashallah, good. Having a lazy Sunday and now chilling out with you, brothers. Can't be, can't get any better. Can't get any better. Mashallah, mashallah. And it's, it's really good to have you guys on. I know it's been a while for Cam and uh, Moody as well, actually. The last time we recorded one, I can't remember, um, but it's been a while. But it's really good to have you guys on the show. Obviously, Rush is uh, uh, my regular co host, you know what I mean? The, the A team, part of the A team. Uh, he's Hannibal. Are we the B team? Um, <laughs> no, no, bro. <laughs> part of the A team as well. But uh, but yeah, no, no, it's good to have you guys on each other. And, and as you know, we've got some really important topics to discuss today. And, uh, you know, without further ado, I think we should uh, make a start. Sure. So the first topic that I want to speak to you guys about, and, you know, let's get a, uh, a conversation going, is the issue about Russia and Ukraine. As you know, it's all over the news. We know that Russia's placed about 100 thousand troops um and you've got tanks artillery missiles uh, basically the you know the full shebang uh, near ukraine's border and uh, even though you know the russians are saying that they've got no intention of of attacking you know the news has gone crazy um so we've got for example uh, nato secretary general jens stoltenberg basically saying that uh, you know if russia was to use force then uh, they will have a high price to pay. And uh, we know that uh, even the UK, for example, they've already trained 20,000 troops in, in Ukraine and they've supplied anti-tank missiles and they're giving support to the Navy and the energy sector as well. So as this issue is, is going on, a lot of people are asking the question or, or waiting basically to see whether um, what plays out, how does it play out? Is Russia going to attack Ukraine? If they do, then how will the West respond? Uh, will it be via force? Will it be uh, just via sanctions against the oligarchs? So there's a lot of questions that are people are asking. So uh, on that note, let's let's kick off the discussion and get into uh, the meaty bits. I'll start off with you, Cam. What was your initial thoughts of uh, what's going on? Okay, inshallah. Um... I think with this issue, you have to look back a bit at, at the history as well of Ukraine and how it became independent. So after the Soviet um, Union collapsed, it, it automatically created a, um, a sort of border along Ukraine because there, the Ukrainian people had a, had a border, had a sort of, a, a sort of a distinct people. Um, and when the Soviet Union collapsed, obviously various parts of USSR was um carved up um and parts of it like the crimea the crimean peninsula the, the the part that borders the uh the red sea um that had always been a very very tactical um bit uh bit of look uh land for the the, the russians and for mm. you know so not only that it stores all their submarines and all their sort of warcraft that obviously uh, deep sea warcraft um and it's also home to a lot of uh, oil rich i mean resources i can't remember if it's oil or gas uh, that it's probably gas most likely um there as well so we need to understand what is russia's sort of um loss if they lost this part of uh you know what they call their near abroad uh, and what does it mean for america and i think that's the best way to look at it firstly um we need to remember that also that um at the moment, there was no tension between Ukraine. Well, there, there has been a, in the recent last re, a recent year, but since 1990s up until now, there hasn't been major war there. And what's happened? What's happening now is just skirmishes here and there in the, uh, over the last few years. So it has had relative uh, sort of peace, keeping it as it is. So what has caused this sudden shift is the fact that the West have now got involved in Ukraine and they they hope that the ukraine would obviously join nato and therefore it will bring a new nato power on the borders of russia which obviously any country in the world would 
if they if they weren't in NATO themselves, they'd be worried because they'd be like, wait, I've got, you know, all the countries bordering me are now part of some global military alliance that could easily provoke me or do something to me. So uh, there's an obvious reason to why Russia are, are, are opposed to this. And that's what's created the tension um, recent in recent times for Russia is the fact that America's progression into their um, lands has been very, very aggressive. Now, I my personal opinion on this all of this is that 100,000 troops along a border isn't enough to go to a direct war with a, a, another country, firstly. So that's not enough. Um, secondly, um, I think there's a bit of a stalemate going on. I think Russia are flexing their muscles to show to the rest of the world that, look, we don't, we're not going to be taken lightly here. You can't just, you know, start having creating this global alliance against us and uh, putting all your, you know, military and weaponry on our border, you know, making these nearby countries, NATO countries, and we'll sit by and do nothing. So there's an, there's an element of show of force from Putin here. And then what the West have done, they knew that he was going to obviously show force. He's not going to just let them take it. So they've used that as part of their media uh, onslaught on Russia to say they're going to attack. And it's interesting to see what's coming out of Russia rather than looking at the Western media. It's better to look at both media um, sides. So obviously on BBC, Sky and all these other news platforms, they're all going down the line of Russia are about to imminent, there's an imminent threat. But if you go on to the, even both the Ukrainian side and the Russian side, they're both saying, go, go, calm down, guys. Stop saying there's a war. There is no war here. Even the Ukrainian uh, president, um, uh, what's his name? Um, uh, Volodymyr Zelensky. Yeah, that's the guy, Zelensky or something, isn't it? Yeah. Um, he himself is saying to, to Biden, stop the rhetoric. Stop saying that there's a war. It's cl- killing our economy. Um, they don't have enough troops on the on the borders to attack us. Uh, because obviously, if it's a direct war, you need a lot more than just military like that. You need air, air, you need aircraft, you need anti-aircraft, you need all sorts. You can't just take tanks to a border. That's not how war works anymore. There's a lot more different military, a lot more capabilities that you need to bring um, uh, on board. And you have to have d- discussions with other countries around to make sure they don't attack you if they go. And, you know, there's a lot of countries around <laughs> um, Ukraine as well. So you can see from the Russian side, they're trying to Russia are show, flexing their muscles. The Western media are using that to say, "Yo, oh, they're going to attack," creating a hype, hype, uh, sort of uh, hype in Europe, and and causing the European leaders to pick sides. And I think that's what's happening right now. I think it's just trying to wake up European, uh, the European leaders, and see which side they're really on. And we can cl- quite clearly see that Germany are are stepping back and thinking, "Shit, this is going to really um, uh, sort of uh, hamper the, the the gas pipeline deal that we've got going with Russia." That's going to pretty much keep the economy going for the next hundred years if they don't do it, you know. And then the other other countries that are a bit more not as um, um, dependent on Russia are more pro and like like Britain and and France that are a bit more pro with America and and going along with the whole um, going along with the whole you know issue. So I think it's it's a bit of that. I don't believe there's going to be a a full blown war or a, or a, a land grab or anything like that. And that's just my opinion. They could well be, and I could be wrong. Uh, but um, I, I believe it's more of a political statement from the two sides. Uh, Russia aren't taking anyone to, aren't taking America's sort of um, threats to uh, make all these nearby countries into NATO countries. That's all. I think that's what it is, really. But uh, okay. yeah, it's definitely really interesting to see what's going no, no. on. That is interesting because, like you said, the uh, Ukrainian leader, he came out saying, look, you're, you know, you're making this issue uh, mm. bigger than it is because not long ago, the Russians had a similar amount of troops. I think it might have been last spring on the border. And if you look at, I mean, just think about what you said. We, R- Russia, basically, when they had a meeting with the West, they had some security demands that mm. Ukraine should be barred from joining NATO. NATO should end military activity in Eastern Europe, pulling troops mm. out of Poland and the Baltic republics of Estonia, Latvia and Lithuania. And the alliance should not deploy missiles in countries near or bordering Russia. So yeah. from you, you can see from that, Russia is actually on the defensive. However, yeah. if you look at how the media is showing it, is they're the aggressor. Yeah. Uh, Modi, what, what's your thoughts on this, bro? Uh, my thoughts, I mean, similar to counts, but slightly different. I would tackle it differently. Um, I don't exactly agree that Russia won't attack because sometimes you have to look into history and the track record of a country to understand what their position is. So, for example, we know in 2008, Russia rolled in the tanks to Georgia and did kind of like intervene and did undertake a military expedition there. 
when they were threatened by in their near abroad. We also know in Crimea, again at the Baltic Sea, when it was egged on by the US and US created this atmosphere, uh, again, when the tensions were high with, with Ukraine, it did kind of like uh, take over Crimea. We also know in 2000, and, uh, what you call it, uh, just before 2000, uh, sorry, after 2008, it also did a cyber information attack on Estonia. So Russia has a track record when it's near abroad and its security um, uh, is threatened, it will go into full action. And we also see, okay, the Americans are trying to obviously escalate the situation. The Ukraine, uh, Ukrainians, especially their president, right? He's trying to calm the situation down because you have to also understand and look at it from the Ukrainian perspective. So for example, if Ukraine doesn't, uh, it does allow the situation to escalate, then effectively what will happen is East Ukraine will be obviously partitioned and it will come under the control of Russia. That's what Russia is basically stating. Now, if you guys don't give me the necessary guarantees around my security, right, and give me the buffer zone that I require, and also don't implement what we agreed at the Minsk, Minsk agreement, then I will launch, yeah? So France is going in there under what's uh, Macron to say, listen, calm down, let's see what we can do. So they're obviously at the negotiation tables. On the other hand, the Americans are saying, actually, do you know what? They've got this military force uh, on the border. Actually, do you know what? You guys need to be careful. We need, we're going to start deploy, give you guys 8,000, uh, circa 8,000, you know, troop numbers, and we'll give you some equipment, right? And uh, 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 equipment, so you can obviously, you know, push back the advance of the Russians if that happens. And they are seriously saying that, look, actually, you know, Russia will invade because it falls into the favor of America to cast, you know, uh, Russia as that scarecrow or the bogeyman, which then allows America to, you know, allows America to unify the, Euro uh, the Europeans on its plans in relation to NATO and European security. Right? Especially, Moriesk, just to uh, drop in there, especially the fact that there's been questions over the last few years of NATO's role because Absolutely. of the role of Soviet Union. Exactly. So you have to look at it in general from the perspective of each stakeholder that's obviously participating in these discussions and has an interest, right? Certainly the Europeans. Hence why Macron had that call on Friday with Putin, and he's trying to obviously pursue the negotiations. And at the same time, they are also trying to be you know, strong and firm in their you know, discussions with the Russians. For example, they are threatening that we will remove you from the SWIFT you know, network. Um, at the same time, they said, OK, the Germans have now come out and said, actually, do you know what, put a pause on Nord Stream 2, right? Almost to kind of like coerce the Russians into, uh, into accepting an agreement. So the French do want to put a proposal on the table, and so do the Russians. Russians don't want to go into a war with Ukraine, but they need guarantees in written format. Hence why they are looking at the Russians and Biden to say, actually, do you know what, guys? If you're serious about this, do you know what? Give me a written agreement, right, that's bound by international law, that will give us the comfort that we need. You have to also understand why has Russia done this in the current moment of time, right? So there was a democracy summit, that was initiated by Biden and over 100, 100 countries attended. Russia, China, along with Turkey, were some of the few countries that weren't invited, right? Which I rated the Russians because that conference was primarily about democracy and security, right? Mm. As the key main you know, headline topics or uh, agenda items. So hence, obviously, the Russians know, actually, you know what? There is something seriously taking place, especially when you start deploying weapons on a country's border, right? Then the way the Russians saw it was actually, you know what, this is a provocation. Mm -hmm. And hence why, you know, um, the Germans came out and, uh, and said, look, we don't want this situation to be a situation where the Russians have a genuine reason to attack the Ukrainians to say, actually, we were provoked, right? When a nation is provoked, then they have their right. And hence why the Russians are also saying, actually, you know what, if you want this situation to calm down, remove uh, Ukraine from the uh, NATO agenda, and don't, let it, don't allow it to become a member. Uh, and we also know what Putin said in 2007 at the uh, Munich Security, Con uh, Security Conference in relation to America and its dominance, and how he wants to divide Europe, but at the same time unify it through NATO, so you can use NATO as a force that will allow the Americans to implement its own agenda, which is at times similar to the Europeans, but in relation to interests and business and economy, it differs because they, at the end of the day, they are capitalists, they have competing economic interests 
and Europe wants to define its own destiny, and hence why Macron's trying to obviously carry the torch for that. And the challenge for the Germans now is actually they've got a new premier in charge, right? Merkel's gone. So he's trying to play mm -hmm. his cards carefully. And you also have to recognise that, you know what, it's not an easy decision for both of them if they do go to war, because Russia ultimately does supply, what's his name, gas. Europe, with a lot of uh, gas and energy supplies, right? So approximately a third of Europe's gas supplies, right, come from Russia. So you literally go into a war situation and you say, actually, we're going to stop Nord Stream 2. Do you know what? You're effectively saying to them, okay, we've got COVID, your economy has been impacted, but you know what? Now you guys won't be able to obviously heat your homes. The necessary fuel that drives the economy is almost dissipating and disappearing. So what will they do? So they all recognise what's at stake, right? Yeah. So yeah. that's I think, that, the, I think that's why Germany, uh, like Cam said, um, falling back a bit now they, they offered to send 5,000 uh, helmets it's like 5,000 helmets what the hell is that going to do um, but now some fantastic points there uh, Rash anything to add on this one bro your perspective yeah just a, a couple of little bits some really good points by, by both the brothers really um, what I would say is that sometimes you kind of need to take a bit of a step back because it's geopolitics and especially in this particular scenario it's geopolitics that involves a hell of a lot of players you know, sometimes when something happens in one corner of the world or even in some of the Muslim lands, you can probably join a few dots and go, that's why it's happening. This one has a hell of a lot of dots to join. And I think if you take a step back, what you'll notice is that you have to almost look at it from the lens of America are the superpower of the world today. To, for them to maintain their supremacy, they need to make sure that the other players are, you know, abiding by what whatever America's plans are to an extent, not directly, but, you know, whatever's happening on the ground is in favour of what America wants to happen on the ground. So what we're seeing is, and Muddy mentioned like the hundred countries coming together and things, that one of part of the reason why the likes of Russia and China are not included in that is because the, is, the world is of the kind of, you know, how it's the it's one superpower now, it's not multiple powers. And they see the likes of China and Russia, even though we understand their ideology to an extent, is still capitalism, yeah? But the way they implement their capitalism with kind of a, a more of a um, single ruler that stays there for a while rather than the typical democracy, as they call it in all the other lands, that allows them to put forward to the masses a certain version of we're the good guys, you know, America being the good guys, we want democracy, justice, fairness, our military is going to go and solve problems, blah, 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 even though all of this has been completely debunked in recent years, but they try to show the likes of Russia and China in a negative light, you know, look, they're authoritarian or all of this kind of view. So I think in recent times, because there's been an element of stability in certain areas, even to the extent that Russia and China have been dealing with one another better than ever before, historically, I think America see that as a threat. They equally see that Europe not seeing NATO as important anymore. They see that as a threat. So this particular event that's happening or these events that are happening is very convenient for America because it's convenient that, and again, we know in, in politics, there are no coincidences. And so therefore what's convenient is Ukraine is a red line for Russia. We know that they're not happy with the idea of Ukraine coming under, under NATO or NATO be, Ukraine being a NATO member state. So it's quite convenient for America that this is happening, causing rift between Russia and Europe, also potentially not allowing that same stability between China and Russia, and therefore creating an, all of this rift away from America where they can carry on doing whatever their internal affairs are, but knowing that they're just pressing little buttons in all of these places, causing more conflict, causing more issues, and being able to stand back and watch the, the events unfurl themselves. So that's why I've been looking at it from that kind of point of view. But again, because it's, like I said at the beginning, geopolitics, a lot of players and a lot of dots to join. So it's a difficult one in, in my personal opinion as well to really put your finger on. 
Yeah, I, mean, I, I think uh, there's also there's always been this this hype that the media is trying to show that you know is there a new cold war between Russia and America? What, what like you said, that America is a sole superpower, and I, Russia and I would even say China are kind of content with them having that role, but mainly when it comes to their own interests, that's when they kick up a fuss. I mean, this is. You know, provocation of the highest level for for America to do what it's doing, trying to extend NATO all the way to Russia's borders. And I think there's loads of things that actually point back all direct all the all the benefits that you see of this conflict. They all fall in the basket of the the Americans because for a while America was pushing this issue of you know why is not why are the Europeans not you know uh, um, funding NATO as well as we are. You know, all these issues that they were raising, you need a scarecrow there. You need, a, a, you know, a threat there in order to get people to buy into that. Um, and we can see that in all of this, I don't think Modi made a good point. The biggest loser is going to be Ukraine, right? If this kicks off, the biggest loser is going to be Ukraine. And re in reality, America, they're not depending on the uh, Russian gas. They're over the Atlantic, Right. It's the it's Western Europe that's gonna that's gonna suffer if you know if this goes that goes wrong. So you can see how they are pulling the strings and you know they they're agitating all the all the sides, they're agitating the issues that affect them, but the puppet master is sitting in in uh, Washington, in uh, Washington DC. Uh Modi, you want to make a point, bro? Yeah, I was just going to say, I mean, 23 Rush makes some good points. So, so, so sometimes you can look at these issues in isolation, but in the grand scheme of things, you have to recognise why are these battles taking place? So, for example, <clears throat> the Russian and the Ukrainian the issue falls into the camp of you know, America viewing the world in two paradigms or from two you know, angles. So, for example, America recognises, and it's listed in uh, you know, the Democrat, Democratic Party's manifesto, uh, when Biden came into what you call it, uh, just before he came into power, and he was part of his election, election campaign and commitment, so he wanted to redefine uh, the position of the U.S. in the world, right? And the other thing he wanted to do was create two camps. One was okay, all the nations that have a have a similar set of values and concepts as America, right? And another uh, versus anyone that carries uh, any values and concepts that oppose the American way of life and values and concepts that America kind of like instills in people and also advocates, right? I.e. primarily capitalism and democracy. So then you have, you know, for example, it said, okay, you've got Russia, which poses a geostrategic challenge to its supremacy, right? Might not be imminent, but it causes issues and they have values and concepts which are contrary to what America is trying to advocate. So it put Russia as a geostrategic threat. Then comes along China, right? Who is a one-party country, right? With you know, a flavor of capitalism in there because they open, uh, they operate in free markets. So it, uh, what you call it, uh, put uh, China in the basket of, you know, someone who poses a threat from a geoeconomic perspective. And then there was a third one, right? Islam. Islam in its entirety is a system, right? which opposes the values, the concepts, and the entire model that America believes in and stands behind, right? Hence why it sees these three areas or nations. One is not a nation because it's not there at the state level, i.e. Islam. So it sees them as a threat and it's trying to put the necessary models and the frameworks in place and it's trying to shape the reality on the ground, mm. right? So it's conducive to America and it allows America to preserve and continue to dominate, right, as a sole superpower of the world, like you mentioned. So that's what it is. So you and if anyone what you call it says actually, you know what, we don't really agree with that. I honestly, wholeheartedly, you know, I would suggest that you look at you know the Demo Democratic Party's twenty two manifesto, right, and what they listed in there, right. So for example, one of the line items in there is that you know well, um, the standpoint of the U.S. in the world, right, through the notion of Western democratic states sharing the same concepts and values rather than historical alliances, which will strengthen America's security and prosperity into the future, as well as averting any uh, potential challenges. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I mean, you, you've just described that there. And that's the, 
that's the view that we should have when we look at this, especially from the American point of view and from an Islamic point of view, when we look at the issues to do with the, the, the nations of the world, our view should also be through the Islamic lens. And if we're gonna, if you know, if we're gonna look from a political point of view, you know, we break up the, the whole world into two sections. You have Islam and then you have non-Islam. And then all the players within there, you have some players who are outright enemies, Whilst other others, you know, even though they may fall under like the non-Muslim uh, banner, however, you may be able to have treaties with and, and work with, and that's the way we would see. And the reality is, is that from that point of view, if you look at what Islam tells us, Islam tells us that you know these the 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 Jews and the Christians, you can't take them as protectors, you can't take them as allies. You know, Allah tells us countless places that you know they wish to extinguish the light of. Of Islam, so so that's why when you look at it, and that was, and I'll give you an example. Was you know when uh, a few weeks ago, a month ago, when Putin made the comment about um, you know uh, insulting the messenger, Salah Salam, you know is is not freedom of speech. Is you know you had a lot of Muslims that were jumping on the bandwagon, unfortunately, but obviously you know they they, they hear something good and they, they want to comment on it and. And they're also, you know, loading this guy and, and promoting this guy. But the reality is, is, A, this is the same guy. If you look at his policies and you look at what he's doing in, in Syria and, and what they did in Chechnya and generally how Muslims and Islam are treated within Russia, you know, it, it shows a completely different picture. However, if you look at it from a political point of view, you get a bigger picture. If you look at it from an emotional point of view, then I think you can get played. And I think... Within the Ummah, that's probably one thing that is maybe lacking is that political awareness, and uh, we can we can probably see from from what's happening. Um, and in regards to the Ukraine issue, what we can see really is that uh, I think this is the American continuation of the American policy of isolating and uh, subjugating uh, Russia. I think they are they are with this move they are trying to uh, achieve quite a few objectives. Um, and the main news, I think what Cam made was a really good point. Most of us will look at what the Western media is saying when it comes to this issue. However, if you look at the Russian and the Ukrainian media, they're saying that this is being so this is something which is being blown out of proportions. And also, if you look from the Russian point of view, Russia is not the aggressor in this. If you know, that's my opinion. They're not the aggressor. In, in fact, they're trying to protect their backyard exactly the same way america would uh behave if you know somebody tried to gain influence in latin america because they view that as their backyard um any other points you want to guys add to this um this this segment before yeah we... i mean just like Paul said you know because i'm looking at some of the quotes and it's interesting there's a which uh, you know part of the um, russian senate there's a guy called pushkov and someone posed him a question to say, look, what's your take on, you know, the Russian and the Ukrainian situation? And he responded and he said, look, the American political and financial elite believe that they are the only ones who can run the world and do not intend to let anyone else take the helm. So until a new world, world order is established in which the US is weak and its role is diminished, we will be in more or less acute political conflict with them. And he said, look, you know, now the Americans have begun to use Ukraine so blatantly and cynically against Russia that the Kiev regime is already itself scared, right? Because they are saying, don't escalate. The Americans are saying, you know, escalate. And you've got the intermediaries like the Germans and the French and also uh, Kiev itself saying, you know, guys, let's calm down, let's turn down the rhetoric, right? And then Lavrov jumped in, obviously the foreign, uh, you know, uh, minister of uh, Russia. And he said, look, the only people that are fleeing the situation, because America was trying to create this hysteria to say, do you know what, people are fleeing, right? He said, the only people that are fleeing are the ones that don't want, you know, Ukraine to be saved. And he goes, for example, the Americans and the Anglo-Saxons. And we all know who the Anglo-Saxons are, right? I.e. the Canadians and the Brits. Yeah, yeah. No, exactly, bro. Exactly. And uh, I think the, those comments really highlight what's happening here. Um, and it's just just scaremongering. And and they, they're trying to, they're, they're prodding. That as you know, obviously, Russia is the big bear, isn't it? It's like they're prodding the big bear to act in a certain way. And what it really, what it also does show, though, really, it does show that st still, even though countries like China and Russia 
from where they were, they have advanced even as local, even as regional powers. It goes to show that the level of um, the think tanks uh, and the, the the politicians in in the states is is a stage is you know a level ahead because it just seems like you know they dictate and the yeah. other countries respond and that 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 is why they you know uh, the the superpower and number one in the world absolutely and the other thing is like to bear in mind as well you know when they're talking about arms and russia did say back in 2008 and even recently putin said just be careful of you know that this doesn't result in an arms race so if there is an arms race right the biggest arms supplier in the world is the americans right and even like recently in, uh, on january the 25th you had Rathian and lockheed martin right mm. they reached out to their investors and said actually do you know what if there is an escalation within the region then it bodes well for our bottom line bottom line meaning profits right and that was also then captured and trans uh, crypt, uh, transcripted in the investment sound called the motley fool fool right and they said look if something does happen then we are the ones that will benefit and in 2008 there was an article in new york times right and they said you know the arms contractors spend so much money and invest so much money in the likes of Rathian and lockheed martin as well as uh, you know um, in these countries to create a situation where people will then reach out to you know the likes of Rathian and Lockheed Martin to buy their weapons so they can obviously get the returns on that yeah no it's a big money game man. and just one, one thing I want to point out as well and maybe get your view on it Cam is that this really does highlight um, the capitalist ideology in the sense that it cannot unify uh, people because the, the Cold War was between two different ideologies. And yeah, as Modi mentioned, I think Orash mentioned that, you know, the democracy or the capitalism in, in, in Russia and, and China is certainly in Russia anyway, is like a different flavor. Nevertheless, you know, they, they still are a capitalist nation. However, if you think about it, they, you know, America has been the number one uh, capitalist nation still is not willing to share a slice of the cake right with with others um purely because of the greed and because of the uh, uh you know uh, inward looking ideology whilst you compare this on with islam and and how islam spread and you know when it spread the, the nations that is the peoples that it spread to they became equal status than the people who came there and then they carried on to the next nation and they carried on to the next nation you never had that feeling and there's a massive difference between you know the ideology ideology of islam and the ideology of capitalism mm. and the, and the and in a sense the power shifted the capital shifted to wherever it was wherever it made sense to shift to you know there was no sort of bias between you know oh well it started off here so it has to stay here that sort of thing so yeah you know it's a really good point i, I was just going to mention that look in this whole ukrainian cri crisis both like options america wins for example if russia decide to invade and annex the whole of ukraine as well as uh, crimea obviously they've got crimea already but annex it officially then um the americans will show uh, russia as a as a as a sort of a, a sort of a power that's going to encroach into europe and and have this um what do they call it the, that sense where you want to expand expansionism and stuff like that mm. so they'll, they'll they'll say they're an expansive power that you know europe europe is threatened nato will then form up all the other countries that were lacking even people like germany who probably would uh wake up and 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 do something so and and will that impact america not really they don't they, there's, there's not much um uh, loss for america if ukraine gets annexed to <laughs> to russia you know, so that the for America, it's not it's win win, um, and if they don't do it, then America will continue to try and push Ukraine into NATO, and therefore still surround the, the Russians. So either way, America wins, and Russia realised that, and I think I think Germany also realised that. That's why they're not doing much. They you know because as soon as they start to pick sides, you can start seeing the the power balance shift now, um, and I think that's a good point to take is that this is a very strategic move from america and it's very clever and um either way you can't see america losing out in any any way i can't see it and i have to also think that um do you know in the uh, rand report for 
war with China this uh, a few years ago. There's a Rand report for war, war with China where America weighed up the odds of whether they should go to war with China to stop them from their GDP growing so massively and, you know, all that sort of thing. And East East Asia, um, the, the waters of East Asia and the issues with Taiwan and all that stuff. So all that stuff was um, sort of written about in this uh, war with China Rand report. And in there also mentions that if China was left alone to it, to their, how they have been for the last, you know, 20, 30 years, then they be will may most likely become a, a very big power that America has to contend with. Um, and by keeping them busy on the shores of East Asia with these mini skirmishes and wars, or even direct confrontation with America, they'll never be able to grow their GDP by a certain amount. So they've done you know, calculations. And they said even if there was a war long, a one year long war with China on those borders, where it will be mainly a sea war, you know, war within the sea, not not actually on land, that would kill uh, China's GDP by thirty percent, just a year. And for America, it only impacts them by five percent. So America are weighing up the financial odds. Oh, five percent, and there's thirty percent. That's going to set them back another fifty years. That gives us enough enough time to, you know, get our development back in order. Get get us making all the right products and stuff and stop it from going over to China. You know, they're, they're thinking about this. And at the same time, they're thinking about it with Russia. So what that, I think what, what Muddy mentioned, that guy, I can't remember the name, he also mentioned something about um, America wants to keep both Russia and China occupied in, in sort of in war so that they're not um, advancing their uh, nations. So it's, it's all, um, yeah, if you, look, if you look deeper, you can still see that America have a, you know, there's a lot of people that are going around saying, oh, look, look at America's weakened power now, mm. you know, what they did in Afghanistan, they to pull out and, you know, they lost all their troops in Iraq. And, you know, everyone's talking in that way that America are this weakened superpower. But what they're pulling in this situation is it shows that they are very much aware of what's going on and how to handle it and what, you know, yeah. plans are in place. You know, in, in recent times, the, me the, the way they use the media has happened to be a bit different to how they used it in the past. You know, you used to notice, mm -hmm. like, you know, a superpower used to try and flex their muscles in the media, show themselves stronger than they actually are. But in recent years, I've noticed that America tries to downplay its power sometimes. You saw it with Afghanistan. You know, we've all we lost out in Afghanistan. Everything was about d defeat in Afghanistan. There's an element of it now about Russia as well. You know, they're going, oh, look, um, some of the articles that are out there are saying that, oh, Putin's been in charge for such a long time. That's strengthened Russia. Now he's using the Ukraine, you know, the opportunity now after annexing Crimea to try and annex parts of Ukraine as well. So a lot of the Western media is actually trying to show America in a weaker light. But actually, if you look at and exactly as you said, you gave the examples of places like Taiwan and stuff, all of these things that are happening on the border of these other powers, definitely not superpowers, is, is in America's favor because it creates or keeps that instability it keeps them busied with things that are closer to home. And all they're having to worry about is, you know, we need to make sure that if we're not actually protecting our borders, then our borders are going to get closed in on us. Mm -hmm. So I think that's a, a new kind of strategy on the media front. And that may be because so many me more people can get access to information now that just lying about your capability doesn't work like it might have done in the past. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, I, I'll echo that. So America does, I mean, but it comes across and it's perceived that it does have a new strategy for how he addresses, you know, international affairs. So, for example, it does want to improve his image internationally, mm. which took a, a massive battering when he went into Afghanistan, Iraq, as well as, you know, the drone attacks he was carrying out in North Pakistan, as well as in Afghanistan. And some of the, uh, you know, um, uh, backfire moments he's had with, how he's kind of like funded Saudi militarily mm. uh, and, you know, the uh, repercussions of that uh, in uh, Yemen as well as in many other places. So I think that's the key thing to also note. And the other thing is, like, going back to, you know, some of the points that I can't mention, don't forget what the objectives of America, uh, what uh, objectives America was trying to achieve with this Ukrainian situation. So, for example, one of the things it does want to achieve is it wants to expand NATO, Right. It wants to penetrate the areas of Russian influence, such as Ukraine, Latvia, etc. And at the same time, it's trying to, what's his name, you know, um, 
increased you know, wariness of Russia and un create uncertainty in the Europeans around their security and the negative impact of not having NATO, right? Which means uh, what that will then do is allow the Europeans to side and be pro-NATO, but at the same time embrace America's international agenda, right? Mm, Which you can't do. So the key thing is America is now doing things from behind the doors, right? In order to improve its international image, uh, and at the same time using proxy forces, right? Which are more cost-effective because America doesn't have to deploy, you know, um, boots on ground uh, while it sits at home uh, 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 on the other side of the Atlantic. It can get the other uh, other people to do its dirty work and keep his, you know, hands clean. Yeah, yeah. No, really good points, man. Yeah, and we also, sorry, just to also add, yeah. we also saw, saw that with, um, do you know, um, was it Oscus or Yukus, something like that? Do you know, the o Australian, Ocus, Ocus. Yeah, the Australian situation oh, yeah. Yeah. where they egged on, you know, the Australians, mm. um, the yeah, French. And maybe that's also another reason why the French don't want to literally uh, play ball with the Americans. Because look, when uh, Macron came in, he, um, he cancelled that deal uh, under intense pressure for the, uh, for the Americans, but they were trying to sell some helicopters to the Russians, a billion dollar you know, deal, uh, which his predecessor, Halan, kind of executed. And then obviously, uh, just before the elections are about to kick in for Macron, he's trying to increase his popularity and ensure that you know he gets a uh, second term. Uh, the Australian thing happens. Uh, again, in the tune of what, circa 40 billion plus deal that gets cancelled. So you can see, you know what, even though they might come across as united, they also have fractures and fissures amongst themselves. Mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, as Muslims, like Mike pointed out, if we are politically astute and aware, then we should be obviously, you know, highlighting these, uh, you know, fractures because at the end of the day, look, they keep on chucking stones at, uh, at Islam and saying, look how weak and disunited Islam is. In reality, actually, you know what, how can it be disunited? Because it's not even at a state, you know, level. It's not implemented at state level. But yet you guys have got states in place and this is your you know, like reality. Yeah, no, exactly. And I think that, that really highlights the, the ideology of capitalism. And, and as Muslims, what we have to understand is that, you know, even though they, are, they have these fault lines, one thing they unite upon is their struggle against uh, Islam. Even though they have really not much in common However, as Muslims, as an ummah, you know, if you look at it, we have far more in common, very few differences. However, we're portrayed as being the people that are, you know, disunited and that we can never unite unless some mystical figure was to descend um, and magically uh, unite us. So now that's some really, really good points, brothers. Uh, and one last point I want to echo uh, before we kind of move on to the next segment is what Cam said uh, in regards to the, the move that America's played here, that it's a win-win situation for them because they've, they've openly said that they won't um, listen to the demands of Russia, what Russia is, is wanting, that agreement. Um, so even though one can argue that in the past, the Americans have agreed to many things which they've gone back on, but they're clearly saying right now that you know Russia is not in a position to, to be demanding uh, what they are. So it's just going to be interesting to see how this plays out now. Um, you know, but one thing that I think listeners should take away is the fact that you know this is this this whole crisis is being exaggerated and is being controlled from the White House, and everybody else in this is just a pawn. And there will be winners and losers, but ultimately the only winner is 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 America. Um, okay, so let's move on then from from global international politics to something a bit closer to home. But it's somewhere <laughs> which I think I feel like it's worth discussing because there is an implication to, to Muslims, certainly those living in the in the UK. So I wanted to cover uh, and get your thoughts on uh, the story about um, the MP, Nuzrat Ghani. And as you might know, she uh, was, she's, she's, you know, revealed um, some breaking news that basically she was sacked from a position as a minister. And when she asked why, you know, was it maybe I was not qualified enough? Maybe my references didn't 
pan out as I wanted to. The answer, the response that she received was that Muslimness was raised as an issue. So they even made a new word up called Muslimness because I've never heard this before, right? Um, and also she was told that basically that, you know, uh, people felt uncomfortable that, you know, Muslim women, as it was said, Muslim women were making colleagues uncomfortable. Now, I don't want to speak too much before, you know, opening the floor. Uh, there's loads to say on this because if you look at the history of Nuzrat, Nuzrat Ghani, a.k.a. Nuz, um, she doesn't fall into the category of someone really who expresses her Muslimness, right? Um, for many reasons, I'm sure we will go into those. So here you have a situation where it's showing really for, for me that, that Islam here is being, and especially with the, the women, because it's a woman situation, right? That this is highlighting that even the most secular, even the most secular Muslim, right? Even though those things they contradict each other, um, will is not accepted, is seen with suspicion, right? No matter what they do, they are seen with suspicion um, purely because they, you know, are Muslims, right? Uh, loads to speak about, but Rash, let, let me let me take this to you, bro. Uh, what, what's your thoughts on the story? Yeah, it, it defines the what the Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, isn't it? About they will never be pleased you with you until you completely change your deen. And you know, um, this there was an interview with some to, another Tory minister, and he was like, you know what? I didn't even know she was Muslim. You know, what's this Muslimness? And I was like, okay, all right, maybe there's some criticism in, but obviously it is a criticism there. But, and, you know, at the end of the day, let's put aside what judgment we, you know, we shouldn't judge people and their intentions and things like that. But what we definitely can judge is her political actions in a public domain. At the end of the day, putting Islamophobia aside for one second, this is someone who has supports prevent. You know, which is an anti-Muslim, a known anti-Muslim policy. She supports it. She's spoken about out against the Sharia. She's spoke, spoken out against the rules of Allah. She's spoken out against niqab. She questions niqab. She questions, um, she's open feminist. So all of these things, knowing all of these things and how she's voted as well, you know, when there were various votes in parliament, she, uh, what was it? She voted for not having an investigation into the Iraq war. Um, she voted for gay rights. So I appreciate that guy, that Tory guy who came onto an interview and said, I didn't even know she was Muslim. If you want to judge someone by their outward appearance and their outward actions and in a public domain, remember, at the end of the day, then what kind of Muslimness is she talking about? And it's, I find it convenient that, you know, that happened two years ago and now she's mentioning it. So just one last point, I'll let the brothers add to this as well, is what the, a lot of people are saying is that this is strategic. The timing of her coming out with this is because she's trying to help force a, a leadership contest because of the problems that Boris Johnson is facing right now with all the partying and stuff that they've been doing during COVID and all of that kind of stuff. So it's just, she's an example of, you know how you used to call them, you know, the house Negro. She's mm. the house Muslim in name only appear on from the apparent, from the outside. But yeah, look, it's, it just shines a negative light on Islam when someone who tries to re represent Islam in that way then gets called out like this so but i think all muslims have realized this and no one's really defending her some people are defending her on the basis that look muslim women in work environments shouldn't have to be treated like this but i don't know it, it sounds very dodgy to me in in my personal opinion yeah uh, just just to add to that is i think the issue is from the way i see it is a wider issue because generally we know within the tory parties as uh Baroness Wasi has uh, said, you know, for years there's a problem with Islamophobia. However, if we we got to look at it from a societal point of view, and if you look at this, there was a report I was reading which was published on January 24th, and in which it said that the Muslims are the UK's sec second least liked group after Gypsy and Irish travellers. Oh yeah. Okay. Um, 
and basically there was a, a quote by uh, Stephen H. Jones, who's a, the lead author of the story. He said, prejudice towards Islam and Muslims stand out in the UK, not only because it is more widespread than most forms of racism, but also because prejudice toward Islam is more common among those who are wealthier and well-educated. Okay, so we see this as a, as a societal issue, but coming to you, Cam, um, would you would you not say that this is a uh, direct result of the propaganda and the media uh, apparatus to demonize Islam and Muslims? Yeah, definitely. I think um, I wrote an article quite a while back. It's probably oh god, going ten years now, isn't it? Um, uh, which was t- talking about the growing, um, essentially how the West um, are supporting this uh, Islamophobia movement uh, across Europe. Um, and I feel like with 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 this um, sister, I can't even pronounce the name properly, what's it? Nusrat Ghani. Nusrat Ghani. Nusrat just, just, just call it Nus. Nus. Nus, okay, yeah. Um, I feel like this could be, like Rash was saying, the timing is quite critical. There could potentially be a, a, a different plan to prevent coming up. And um, I feel like people like this that worked previously on the other prevents and now are being sacked for their Muslimness gives them some sort of credibility to be the new uh, leaders of these of a new prevent movement or or something similar because that failed so badly Mm. so there's definitely talk of something replacing prevent but for the last few years they've just been so busy with Brexit they've been busy with just their internal economy then Covid came so that's why we've not seen much happen after the failure of Brexit uh, until obviously now seeing these stories about why and, and how she came out at this time. So we need to watch the space and see what she heads up with the government in in the near mm-hmm. future. I think definitely she's going to be part of some sort of committee that works towards a new plan for Muslims in, in the UK. Um, so definitely watch that name in, in any any sort of group that is formulated. Um, and then generally, we, we know that there's a, you know, whether it's on purpose or it's just the natural hatred for Islam, that this is, you know, growing Islam, or even the term Islamophobia, they, they created it, but we just know it's just this, it's just a, the, the ideology that dislikes Islam because it goes against everything that they stand for. Um, and the party that's in power at the moment, the, the, the Tory party have historically always hated Islam. We know Boris Johnson's views on Islam, you know, the, calling the niqab the, a letterbox and all sorts of things that he said in the past. Even today, even till now, he's still making remarks that you'd think mm, that's a bit dodgy as a, as, a, as a prime minister, but he has to be a bit more careful. So you know that the, their party has these issues from a very long time ago as well. So I, I don't know if it's a, a concerted effort or if it's just a natural you know effort now of you know people just hate islam because muslims are becoming more and more revived they're following islam more therefore they are now exposed more to the to the opposite angle of obviously people that dislike islam and then there's a clash so i think it could be could well be that rather than there being this concerted effort of movements and funding to to attack it Mm. obviously a few years ago with prevent and stuff that felt like it more because it felt like well, look at all this money they're pumping into prevent into you know we saw we knew people in society in our areas that were taking the money and doing certain actions and working alongside the police and all sorts and that's really died down in the last few years because i think there's been a shift in strategy they realize that's failed so we need to now be careful of what is the new plan for all of europe not just uk it's going to be a it's going to be a europe wide or any any western country that has muslims that are growing in sort of their uh, muslimness <laughs> Yeah, yeah. I think that the plan, the prevent plan, I don't know how active they are, but I think one of the reasons is they realised that they were just pumping in money to local guys who were just just taking the money exactly. and just yeah, it's putting out tick fail. boxes. And even if they even if they did feel like part of the struggle, they were discredited amongst the normal yeah, Muslims really. because as yeah, soon yeah, as you yeah. found out they were working with prevent, you know, you saw them as sellouts. Mm, um, and one, one thing, one quick thing I want to I want to uh, add my opinion is before I move on to Muddy, if he's got any thoughts on this, is that you know I, I do believe that you know when we talk about capitalism and we talk about the the ideology and the ideological people, you know I think within there you've got layers. So you've got those who are running the the, the governments, right? You got, you got and then you got the the capitalists in the background, the deep state. 
And I do believe that the sort of hatred that you see uh, from normal folk, which we see on, on clips on YouTube and all that all the time, right? I do believe that's out of ignorance because of the fact that um, they're just buying into the, the, the false propaganda that's being pushed. And because, because there's no real, real model of Islam being implemented anywhere, they can't verify that or they can't weigh that up against that. Um, and I think, they, I think it's a big obstacle to the normal people and that's why if you think about, I'm not probably going off on one here, but if you think about when Islam spread and the, the Muslims would go to the king or the, the guy in charge of the, the city that they're going to take Islam to, right? And they would offer him Islam, okay? And if he, if he didn't accept it, that means as an individual, he didn't accept it. The next option was, that's fine, stay as you are, but we're taking the city and, and we're implementing Islam here, right? Mm -hmm. And... If they did, if they refuse that, and then they would be for the people would be for who would be for is those people that are an obstacle, the authority that's there, hmm. who have been who have been provided with the 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 sound evidences, who who for whatever reasons have you know uh, denied accepting, so you have to remove them in order for the people to see and get a fair hearing of what Islam is, and I think that's just. The, today, because that, that example is not there, I think a lot of normal people out there, the views that they have are being fueled by the social media and this propaganda and this, and this media where now it's become normal for people to criticize Islam. If you were to probably dig, dig deep, you know, it's just sound bites. They don't, there's no substance behind what they say. Uh, Modi, any, any thoughts on this story, bro? You're on mute, uh, you're on mute bro. You're on mute. Um, to be honest, I was just listening to you guys because I haven't really been following the story. And when you mentioned the word uh, Muslimness, uh, the first thing that kind of struck my mind was uh, the EDL chap who was talking about Islam and calling the Muslim Islamic. Muslim right. Reagans. Yeah, <laughs> Muslim Reagans. So that just goes to show, you know, whenever you get these kind of terms and depending on whose mouth it comes out from, how, how Islamic they are and how much they know about Islam, which kind of like epitomizes, you know, this story as well, in my view. Um, the way I see it is this woman. I mean, based on, you know, the brief reading I've done is that she was kind of like removed from the Conservative Party for being, well, for her Muslimness. Now, what that means, I don't know. But some of the points that Cam has mentioned in relation to, you know, how Boris Johnson and the Conservatives are very much seen as very anti-Islamic. They had that party gate scandal that was going on. Mm. Um, obviously, what they are probably, in my view, are looking to do is, OK, you know what, the, con whole, the Conservative Party as a whole due to his performance, right, needs to kind of come out fighting. And how do, how do we do that? Now, A, obviously, everyone's at the moment anti on this anti-bandwagon of Boris Johnson, including his own peers within the party, right? So this woman coming out raises the profile and changes, you know, the focus from party gate to this woman in the eyes of the Muslims. Maybe it could also be a case of saying, actually, you know what, the Conservatives if they do need to win the next elections, and if Boris is at the helm, then maybe they need to appeal to the Muslims in a different way. Maybe they need to integrate Muslims. Maybe it might be a method or a way to entice Muslim women into politics because this woman comes out and says, actually, the reason why I was forced out was because of Muslimness, right? So what does that mean? How can the party now restructure, or even uh, you know, the political parties as a whole, how do they restructure to entice the Muslim population because at the end of the day, look, if you want to change the way they, what they believe is, look, the Muslims are always on the sideline or on the askers because we carry views and opinions that oppose their way of life and their systems and their values, right? And you can't change someone, right? There's no dialogue and if, they're not, if they are not part of the system. So you need a mechanism to entice, right? You've got this woman, unknown, all of a sudden gets so much publicity and popularity out of the blue, right? Yeah, when you dig into her past, like uh, Marge and even like you, Rash said, she was someone who consistently voted for any investigation into the Iraq war, even though it was built, the entire Iraq war was built on a dodgy dossier, right? She is anti-EU, i.e. pro-Brexit in my view, right? Which means, you know what, the whole Brexit case was built on what? Mm -hmm. Anti-immigration, right? 
and xenophobia of people like the Muslims, right? So, and then on top of that, even her on a, if you look at her, there's nothing Islamic about her, right? She doesn't wear, you know, the uh, hijab and the abaya, etc. right? She wears skirts, she's married to a non-Muslim, right? Who's a director of Sky. So you think to yourself, okay, why her, right? We also know how the you know, feminist agenda is on the rise, right? At the moment, it's not heavily focused on the Muslims, even though certain general you know, quarters of the Muslim community are starting to incline towards it, right? Uh, that don't carry the correct concepts, they, so they allow themselves to be kind of like become you know, entrapped. So maybe they think actually, you know what, we need to instill the feminist agenda within the Muslims, but at the same time entice the Muslim community into the political landscape that falls into our favor, i.e. non-Islamic political system, then how do you do it? You know what? Get Nusrat Ghani on the front page. Um, so that's my opinion. Um, and yeah. yeah. I mean, if, if, they, if they're trying to get uh, more people involved in the, the Tory party, they're not, they're not going... They're not doing a good job. The, the right. Yeah, yeah <laughs> I was going to say... Do you, know, do you know what it is? It's like with anything, right? If you want to change the landscape, like America does, and one of the things I did want to say, like, and I forgot to mention was, you have to look at the models and the frameworks framework that these guys put in place, right? Which acts as a prelude or the pretext to intervene in the affairs of the Muslims, right? America creates a situation on the ground, right? Sits back, observes, then recognizes actually this is how we need to tackle this situation, right? And again, maybe this woman is that, you know, kind of like um, guinea pig, right? Mm -hmm. To entice right, and also gauge the reaction of the Muslims in relation to conservative party, female, uh, Muslim female being involved in politics, etc. So it, maybe at the moment they're sitting back, gauging the reaction and then taking it from there. On, on that note, they, just yeah. before I bring, come, in, come back in is, if that was the case, then it just goes to show that from all this, this scenario that's happened is our voice needs to be amplified. Absolutely. I, you know, if there's the, if there's the incorrect message being pushed, whether that's feminism, whether that's, whether that's conservatives are going to become a bit more uh, Muslim friendly, uh, Muslimic friendly, then basically, uh, you know, if they're trying to push these things, then what we need to do is we need to counter this with the issues to do with uh, the ummah and the issues to do with the fact that as Muslims, no matter where you are geographically, you're part of one ummah, one family, and that's where your loyalty lies, that's where your allegiance lies, and these are the things which they are eroding, uh, they, 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 they're working to erode, and even something small, I don't want to talk about this much, but just to give me a one small example, is even the issue when it comes down to the moon sighting, and it comes down to Ramadan and Eid and stuff, and what do we see? We see this new narrative being pushed about you know localized sighting localized sighting someone may say is a different opinion i'm talking about it where it's basically promoting it more to do with nationalism i.e whichever country you're in you need to do it with the people there and so on and there are efforts to 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 push these type of ideas and one thing that this type of episode highlights to me is that look as as rush mentioned the 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 you know tra uh, translation of the meaning of what Allah SWT tells us that look these people are not going to accept you until you follow the way and one last point before I come to you Kam is that I actually read a, 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 a taf the tafsir of Ibn Khathir on this and he said that you know in reality even if you left your deen they will still hold you with suspicion because at one stage you were Muslim, Muslim before. you look at this person what she calls for, the stuff that she's country, she said about Sharia, which some may argue is kufr, right? Because they're that hardcore. Married to, I'm not going to say non-Muslim, because David could be Daoud, I don't know, right? But the point is, though, there's a lot of problems going on there, right? However, they still find resistance in that man. But there's just a few things to for us to think about and what, on the back of what Moody's saying is how we can use this mm. to get the correct message out rather than letting them succeed with their devious plans. Uh, Cam, I think you wanted to add something, bro. Yeah, I was just going to say, if, um, you know, it could well be what Muddy said, that, you know, they could be just testing the waters and seeing uh, whether new Muslim women come forward. Or it could be the complete opposite, in that Boris Johnson, obviously, and the Conservative Party got power based on their anti-Islam 
rhetoric and being uh, opposed to Muslims and being a, a racist party, right? So the more they do more of these racist actions, what did it, it help them get more of a majority? You know, if you look at the last elections, they smashed it. Yeah, we saw it in like, Europe as well, isn't it? Those people who get voted in on those anti-immigration, anti-Islamic um, kind of um, vote, and, they have to make sure they maintain that yeah. level of anti in mm. order to maintain their votes. Mm. Yeah, and what, 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 which area? Yeah, was she an MP? Well, what area yeah. was she? she Wilden. Uh, Wilden. Is there, is there a lot of Muslims there or not? I don't know. I don't think so. I'm yeah. not, I so, don't know. Where, where's, it, where's that? It, it, it could well be those areas that were going towards Labour and they thought, mm, do you know what, we can uh, sack a Muslim or Muslim by name MP off and look, all of a sudden the, those areas become conservative. You know, I don't know what area is, probably not even worth making that argument until we know what area it is and whether it's Labour at the moment and, mm. and she's um, just mm. not doing a good job. But you can tell from all the anti-Islamic actions, it, what it did in fact was actually give them more of a, a vote when it came to elections. So um yeah, yeah it, could, it could well be the opposite it could you know uh, to be honest uh, it could be all these things or it just could be the fact that the guy who dismissed her just hates islam that much yeah. that the muslim uh, the the muslimness of this person was you know uh, he couldn't stand it any longer however in everything we've said i think there's something to take away one thing i would say though and it's, is it, it's, I think, it's something for everyone to think about, at least, the listeners. I didn't know it was two years ago that this issue happened. Mm. And, uh, even though there's thing, there's, there's, there's talk about, well, she should have gone to, she, when she was offered for an internal uh, conservative investigation, she refused. And the reason why she's saying she refused is because this is to do with the government. It's not to do with the party, because this was in a government opposition, right? Mm. However, I didn't know it was two years, and I think, I think that's something which you can't discount. I think that's something which you can't rule out. Why now? Um, yeah. yeah that, really trying to put the nail in the coffin for Boris then? Yeah, I mean, that's what I think Russia's saying. That's what people are saying. The problem is we've got to be careful. This, this, the, Their politics is so dirty. Have you noticed in recent years, these kind of either the Islamophobia card or the anti-Semitism card or the racism card or the, you know, the, the politicians are corrupt card. They come out quite conveniently and a lot of the more important, important issues for the people, you know, like homelessness and, you know, or the price of price of food, price of electric going through the roof and all of these things. That's what's important to the people, yet their disgusting, despicable politics is busy talking about all of this bullshit, maybe really, at the end of the day. Maybe they're trying to highlight conservative, cons the Conservative Party is an elitist party, right? And if you're from a particular type of background, actually not in particular, any other background, that doesn't really fall into, you know, well, the... the 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 Tory party, what is it? Someone or the prime minister, the most prime ministers now because of Boris Johnson and um, David Cameron, it's like nineteen of them or something have come from Eton. So what does that tell you about where these prime ministers come from and what their interests are in terms of maintaining the capitalists and the wealthy in this society rather than the people who are really suffering? But one thing we can highlight alongside what Majid Khan mentioned these parties do not serve the interests of the muslims these parties don't yeah, even serve the interests of the non-muslims the, the people that do participate right <laughs> even someone such as you know this like nusra ghani right from the face of it right from the outside or outside they said she doesn't even look like a muslim right or even come across as a muslim right right still she was an actress and effectively forced out May Allah guide him. May Allah guide him, and we shouldn't question in in other stuff. But yeah, at yeah. the end of the day, at the end of the day, look at yeah, it's it's apparent from the outside. But May Allah guide her. That's all I'll say. No, of course. So. Like, you know, some Muslims who think they can make a difference and help the Muslims by partaking in the system and trying to change it from within. It's a huge uh, like wake. Yeah, I, I I I don't think I don't think from from seeing based on actions that that she falls into that criteria. Um, when I first heard the story, one of the main things that that uh, you know I was a, a bit of a bit of a hit was the fact that she's from Azad Kashmir. But 
besides that, I think you know the, the main the main issue is is our rash is saying, look, we're not here to judge anyone's intention and stuff, you judge for the apparent. What I would say, what I would say, uh, my my sort of final thoughts on this story is the fact that you're right, there could be all these dynamics at play. Um the one thing that we can definitely take away, that the listeners can definitely take away, is the fact that no matter how much you want to change Islam, no matter how much you want to change what Islam means to other people, um, it's not going to do you any good. Um, you can sell out and you will still be rejected. And I think this is a key message for everyone. And it's not just talking about Nusrat Ghani. They can be talking about something as big as working in government, but it also could be something to do with, you know, the everyday issues we have at workplaces. You know, whether it's like I was speaking to some brothers earlier, whether people now tend to use nicknames rather than their, is, is their Muslim name. And so, you know, s- small things which we think that we may be able to do for people to kind of accept us. Mm. Uh, and, and the reality is, is that, uh, you know, <laughs> it doesn't happen. Mo's you find at work now. <laughs> yeah, yeah Mo yeah. And, and, and all sorts. And I think, I think that, that's something that I, I would take away from this. I think that's something that I would take away from this is that be yourself. You're Muslim. We are, you know, uh, the slave slave servants of Allah Subhanahu wa Taala. And you know, if you're if you can um, kind of incorporate the the Islamic values of being honest, of being you know upfront, of being transparent, of being just just basically a, a Muslim, right? Which, you know, as I say, if a Muslim enters a community, this is an asset for the community. Mm. Nowadays, people will be on the, on the, you know, the, the phone to 999. But the, the, the point is that if you can embody these principles, then you know what? As long as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is pleased with you, right? Don't worry about the creation. If the creator is pleased with you, you know, don't worry about the creation because you know what? They're never going to be pleased with you. They're not even pleased with their own people. Forget pleased with someone who comes from a totally different viewpoint in life. So th- that was my final thoughts on this. So guys, inshallah, I want to get your final thoughts on, if there is any, because we've already spoken about so much anyway, um, on this story or the other one, or any, any few points of uh, advice or, or stuff you picked up throughout the discussion, really. But Rashad, I'll start with you. Anything you want to add, bro? Not particularly, just on the the your original topic, you know, topic of Ukraine, I think maybe just advice to myself and everyone is that we might think it's not really a, an Islamic issue because we think, oh, OK, it's not really that many Muslims involved and stuff like that. But actually, we should do a bit of reading on history and stuff. And from a geopolitical point of view, everything affects Islam, uh, you know, Muslims, you know, even Crimea, apparently a uh, Crimea has got like, 12% Muslim population. Or Crimea Tartars, was, Tartars was the Tartars awesome. are there. They were part of the Islamic That's state right. at one point. Um, things like that. And again, you know, like okay, Ukraine, we're not talking about we're talking about Crimea, but at the same time, these things are are linked, and at some point they will affect Muslims. So even though right now they might not be specifically affecting Muslims, if there is a war there or something, then Muslims will be affected by it. So we should you know just be more politically astute more politically aware and keep an eye on these things because at some point in time they will affect us and then it's too hard to go back digging and and joining all the dots yeah no jazakallah for that bro uh come any final thoughts um i'm just going to say that we have to remember even from the lifetime of the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam that the the victory obviously comes from Allah, but it also came at a time when the Rus- um, the Russians, were the um, Romans, <laughs> Romans and the um, uh, Persians, Persians were at war with each other, oh, and all the superpowers were occupied. And it's similar to today's time where America's focus, and you can see from the last few uh, reports that have come out that their focus has shifted a lot towards China and Russia as opposed to Islam. Um, or Muslim nations because they feel like they've probably done their work and it, or le- left them you know on fire in the Muslim world and now we're going to focus on China and Russia and that could be a, a ble- you know a blessing in disguise for Muslims to now work harder to bring back the resumption of Islam while they're busy fighting each other you know so and, that, and that's how you know that's how it helped the Muslims in the past why can't it help us again today Subhanallah man no no sound advice bro sound advice uh, Modi any, any final thoughts my brother I mean, I'm just going to like repeat, you know, what I said previously in regards. Don't repeat to- what you said. <laughs> <laughs> it will be here forever. If the- uh, no, just to summarise, it's like what's his yeah, name? Yeah, we're missing. There's good to um, 
you know, look up world events, also, you know, be closely you know, uh, uh, acclimatized to what's happening in Ukraine, including like the Khan issue and men, many other issues that do happen on the international scene, because what it does allow you to do, it allows you to then develop your own framework and understanding the situation on the ground and how it then impacts the Muslims. So for example, like I said, with the Ukrainian situation, it allows you to understand actually, do you know what, what is the model which the superpower uses to operate? And how does it then get executed on the Muslims as well? So for example, the model that it's using in Ukraine is no different to how it executes that same model, right, with few tweaks in the Muslim world. So, for example, it encourages a mass in the Middle East to call for freedom and democracy, why different Arab Springs, and people yeah. forget the Ukrainian situation didn't happen because Russia lined up 100,000 uh, you know, soldiers on the border. It started from the Orange Revolution back in 2004, right? The Muslims were treated to the Arab Spring, right? And then it, and also how the same framework is used to implant, you know, oppressive ru rulers um, within the Muslim world and also to suppress anyone that inclines towards Islam or has any notion of uh, trying to say, okay, I need to be working towards a political, you know, change through Islam, right? Because with the aim, right, and this is the key bit, with the aim of deepening, you know, the need for their freedoms and democracy and trying to reconcile them with Islam and making Islam something which is alien, alien to the Muslims as opposed to what it was and what the Prophet Sallam and Allah gave us. Mm. No, no, subhanAllah, very important point. Uh, it, and it's it's really good to, inshallah, end on that that point as well. So, guys, really is a really fantastic, enlightening uh, discussion with you guys. And definitely it also uh, is it's a good reminder that I need to get uh, Cam Moody on a bit more regularly because, no, you know, the insight you guys bring it's really, really profound, to be honest with you. So, Jazakallah khair for your time. Um, and, uh, you know, hopefully people will benefit from uh, the discussion. I certainly have anyway. I'm sure others will as well. So, you know, Jazakallah uh, to uh, all the listeners and all those watching. As you know, you can access the Islamic Bias podcast on, on YouTube, uh, on my Past to Revival channel and all popular podcast platforms. On that note... My brothers, Jazakallah khair for uh, your input and short notice of coming on. And inshallah, ta'ala, I'll see you guys on the next one. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Wa alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.